Charleston County is the place where 40% of all enslaved Africans arrived in the U.S. The historic landmarks, settlement communities, and land of these Gullah Geechee people, the descendants of the enslaved Africans, are being lost to development and gentrification. Consequently, their culture, experiences, and contributions are going largely undertold, which often leads to a lack of awareness and appreciation of their contribution to the community. Charleston County has experienced unprecedented growth over the last few decades. And as more people move to Charleston County, the need for new development threatens existing cultural resources. Within the past couple of years, Charleston County's historic African-American communities have experienced a lot of challenges. However, ownership and connections to the land remain a vital component of their Gullah identity. The foundations of the Gullah cultural traditions in the Low Country were extended family associations religion, and strong connections to the land. Churches and cemeteries served as a central land within these communities. Historic preservation advocates stated that cemeteries and African-American buildings and sites are the most threatened types of historic properties in the state. The Center for Heirs Property Preservation has a Gullah Historic Preservation Project that is centered around historical African-American communities in Charleston County. As part of this project, community mini grants were awarded to nine historical African American communities. Let's take a look inside each of these communities and experience how they are planning for their future by preserving their past. Oh, ecstasy! This is our original congregation who started here at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. This is a picture of our deacons and our pastor. This is Pastor Jakes, Deacon Jacobs, Deacon Bugsby, Deacon Bugsby Sr., Deacon Gathers, and Deacon Drawder. My name is Sheila Fields, and I am from Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. My organization is a historic church, which was built back in the 1800s. Friendship Missionary Baptist Church came to 75 America Street back in 1960. They acquired the property because they had to move from two other sites where they were located in the Charleston area. Are you seeing gentrification in your community? And if so, what does that look like? Gentrification has already occurred. And many of my neighbors, they have been displaced from the gentrification. And at our church site, which is an old historic site, we would like to preserve and renovate our building, whereas they still can come back and worship at our church. We needed this grant because our church was built back in the 1800s, and over the years, with the wear and the tear, we had been fixing the roof, but it would be really nice if we had a new roof for this historic site. How is the community going to benefit from this project? The community would benefit from this project very much because we would still have a historically black church in the community, whereas where gentrification has come and occurred, they could still come to a church that has been in the community since the 1800s. We have 
quite a few seniors in their 90s. We have a coding program for our kids. We have computers for the youth. We have a golfing program through Deacon Jacobs. And this grant would allow us to still be the cornerstone of the community. It is the mission of our committee to let the entire world know about the great heritage that is a part of our community, known as Liberty Hill. And for that reason, we just want them to understand that the legacy lives on, and they have a responsibility to pass on to their children, that we have got to be completely vested into the community, because there's a ripple effect as a result of that. My name is Hester McFadden, and I'm from the Liberty Hill community. I'm Lisa Robinson, and my descendants are from the Liberty Hill community. And I'm Carolyn LeCue, born and raised or reared on Liberty Hill. We are members of the Liberty Hill Improvement Council, and more specifically, we are on the steering committee for the Liberty Hill Reunion Committee. The Liberty Hill was originally acreage owned by uh, free people of color, Paul and Harriet Trescott. Paul's father, we're told, um, was, it was a, a slave owner. He was white and he was a slave owner and he married Harriet. Um, and, and apparently Paul inherited the property that is now known as Liberty Hill. In 1861, St. Peter's Amy Church was established at the Navy Yard, what is called Turnbull. This is where they set up a tent there. In 1864, Paul and Harriet Trescott donated two acres of property on what is now Liberty Hill to St. Peter's African Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1871, four freedmen, Aaron Middleton, Ishmael Grant, William LeCue, and Plenty LeCue purchased 109 acres on Liberty Hill. They thought they purchased 111, not knowing the two acres had previously been given to the a &E Church. So it was actually 109 acres that these four men purchased for about $900. They worked and paid the money off. They subdivided the property between friends and family, and the rest is history. Okay. We're still there. Remember when y'all was talking about gentrification? Mm -hmm. This is a very good idea oh. of being able to see like how yeah. Yeah. these yeah. things are happening. Yeah. 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 This historic community has been such an established community for so long. In fact, it's the oldest established community in North Charleston. And we were talking about a lot of folks who vested in their entire lives and tried to promote economic growth and stability and faith and family. And we're seeing all of that dissipate because of gentrification. We've seen houses that are built up around the community and it, it breathes our spirit, as I, as I said before. And we are really trying to get our children to understand that because our predecessors invested so much of their themselves, their heart, their soul, their spirit, everything into the community. We are trying to stop this influx of economic growth without us being a part of that growth. And so this is our mission so that our children um, and future generations will understand that this is a, a strong historic community and we're going to hold on to it at all costs. And speaking of this strong historic community, that leads us into the project that y'all are working on. So if you wouldn't mind, could you tell us about the historical preservation project that you're working on? Well, using the term that you said, preservation, we are so um, crushed by what we see with gentrification and seeing properties being lost to other people and families um, just losing the sense of history. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to create a project that will engage the whole community to take their hand in this project. And so two of the things, one being that St. Peter's A&E, the cemetery, is to our knowledge the oldest black cemetery in the North area. And for us, that is huge. And so to honor our ancestors and those who came before us, we want to beautify the cemetery. We want to preserve the cemetery because we know every headstone that is there, there's a story behind the headstone. Mm -hmm. 
there's a story that is just screaming to be told. People want to know about their ancestors. People want to know about this town, this place called Liberty Hill, because for a hundred years or more, we're going to 150 years mm -hmm. coming up, and that's 150 years of powerful stories. And so we're going to beautify both St. Peter's AME Cemetery and Grant Cemetery. I'm standing here at Grant Cemetery, which was established in 1915 by the descendants of Ishmael Grant Sr. There are maybe 50 to 60 graves, I believe, out here. And the founding member of Liberty Hill is also out here. And also we want to create a community garden and when we do the garden we want to again engage the whole community to come out to help um, plant the seeds. Would you mind talking about the role Charity Foundation is going to play with this garden? Absolutely. Students from our feeder pattern schools, North Charleston Elementary, Morningside Middle, and North Charleston High will be actually tending to the garden, learning more about horticulture, and learning how to uh, grow their own food. And speaking of the food, what, what kind of stuff do you think is going to be grown in the garden? We're going probably into a fall season, so maybe like a lot of leafy greens, squash, things like that um, for this season. But it, it's definitely going to provide an opportunity for healthy options. And I know anyone who gets a chance to put their hands in the dirt and see the fruit of their labor, it really is rewarding um, health benefits and also do something mentally and emotionally to see the fruits of your labor. Personally, what I want the world to know is that we hail from kings and queens all the way from Africa and knowing that South Carolina, Charleston in particular, is where 40% of the slaves came from. When they left Africa, they landed down at the wharf in Charleston and inevitably some came to Liberty Hill. And so as the descendants of that rich heritage, we don't want to just honor the past, we want to create a future that will just make a powerful testament so the world can see how beautiful Liberty Hill truly is. What they want to do right. and what not. But this is the site of Deming, Frederick Deming's um, industrial school, the, probably the first one in the whole state of South Carolina for blacks. And this is, you're standing on what is probably the oldest street in the entire state of South Carolina. Oh, wow. Because this road, this street, actually takes you directly into where the Lord Proprietor's Joseph West home was. Okay. It ends there at Fifth and Main Street. And there, some of the research says even with the, whatever the physical boundary line, that it still um, is evidence that it's the oldest street. In South Carolina or Charleston? South Carolina. Wow. Remember, this is where South Carolina began. Right, fair 16, true. 16, Yeah. Yes. Wow. 16, 17. All right. That's crazy. Let's mm -hmm. go check out one of these other spots. Okay. I'm Diane Hamilton, uh, president of the Maryville Asheville Neighborhood Association. I'm Donna Jacobs. I live in West Ashley. I wrote the book on West Ashley and Burns Downs, and I learned about the community of Maryville Asheville during my research for the West Ashley book, and that's when I met Diane. I'm Charlie Smith. I also live in West Ashley. We have all three served together on the West Ashley Revitalization Commission and began to work together on uh, things of, of historical interest. But this was the home of the last mayor of the town. The town's charter was revoked in 1936. Looking at my community started with a question I had about 10 years ago, and that is what did my neighborhood look like before the construction of St. Andrews Boulevard? And so I went to Avery, and I found a thesis there that told me about uh, the background, it had some interviews of individuals that I recognized, and then I started interviewing uh, some of the oldest members in the community in order to determine what it looked like from their perspective. And that's what started me on this journey and brought us to where we are now. I found out that I lived, and still live, in a historic neighborhood, which is Maryville Asheville. 
that there was actually a town created in 1886. Um, in 1888, it was incorporated by the um, um, state, the General Assembly. And it was interesting too, we know that there was a, an organization prior to 1888, the incorporation, because in order for the incorporation to take place, they had to give up their current charter. So we know there was something there, and we dated to 1886. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the news and courier, as was called in that day, reported on things that were happening in the town of Maryville. Uh, for example, um, at a town meeting in 1881, we saw where Mary Matthews Just was named the postmistress. We also know the town was made up, or the offices were all people of color, because they used the term colored people. We discovered the police force, and turned out I knew one of the gentlemen. But I remember Mr. Bill, but I was a little child, but I didn't realize that he was, he had, he was just the old man I saw going through the neighborhood, not mm -hmm. knowing what he had done early in his life. But I had no idea that he was a part of something that was of a historic nature, but he was a police officer, a Mr. William Wigfall. <laughs> founded on the peninsula. It's over 100 years old. It's a private club, African American professionals. When I was a child, there's no way I could put foot in that building. Why? I was not of that social class. It was for the professionals, the doctors and the lawyers and whatnot. Wow, and it's still in existence today. Still in existence today. So you still have to be of the bourgeoisie to get in there? Yeah, but I can get in now. Given the rich history of Maryville, mm -hmm. this is going to be a very interesting question for y'all to answer. Let's talk a little bit about gentrification. We've been asking everyone, uh, have they seen gentrification take over their neighborhoods? And if so, what does that look like? I mean, for a town whose charter was revoked, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a whole different question. So if you could, though, what is Maryville, Ashleyville, the neighborhood now, not town, what does gentrification look like? in that area of West Ashley? I think we, we're seeing uh, more uh, signs of gentrification that are, are more visible nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the issues that come up are heirs' property issues that come up yes. in the neighborhood mm -hmm. because you have families that, that uh, have been uh, tied to these properties for generations, but now the younger generations are not here. There are lots of people who are involved in the ownership of the title because they, they all have interest in it from having inherited those interests. And then once the older generation has gone, there's nobody living in the property, and then the physical property begins to deteriorate, and you, you begin to see these things uh, uh, kind of shifting. And there has been uh, some strong interest from investors in buying property that's beautiful property, very close to the water, very close to downtown, that uh, all the reasons that everybody has always wanted to live in, in that area. And Maryville to me is a treasure. I would sort of say it's probably a national treasure from many aspects of it because of the formation of the town, the timing um, of the town, the involvement of Mary Just, this woman who was an incredible woman, incredible business, forward thinking. I can make the argument it is the first platted subdivision for a neighborhood in West Ashley. That's unique. What is everybody, everybody wants to own a piece of land, own their own home. This was specifically platted on a map so that people can do this. It wasn't just an organic random you know, specifically for African Americans to come and have that sense, like everybody does, of home, a place to plant a, a, a garden, you know, just to have a sense of community. I want you to talk about the project that you're working on. Tell me about this book mm -hmm. and, and, and give, you know, a little detail for people who, who don't know anything, because I don't know, I want to learn. <laughs> okay, as I collected this materials, I decided, I was thinking, what can I do with it? And my primary purpose is to educate the public 
as well as those who live in Maryville. Just like I've lived there all my life until 10 years ago, I didn't know what a historic spot that I was living in. It's such an important place. So I think this knowledge needs to be available because once you know this, you behave differently. Now you have power when you have, they say power is knowledge, a knowledge is power. And once you have that knowledge, it gives you power. So I guess I'm trying to empower the people who live, yes. whether they were the original or not. Uh, in the community. My name is Beatrice M. Pinky, Jacqueline W. Young, Josephine Brown, Eleanor Pinkney, and our association is called um, Fleming Road, Central Park, and Riverland Drive Station. This community was founded by um, slaves, a freed slave. So the freed slaves came to this community, and it's actually uh, several parts of it. This property has been here for 100, over 120 years. This whole area here. The, um, the house up there is where my great grand in laws stayed. And the house next to that was where the great, great, great grandfather stayed. So this area is really rich with, you know, our heritage. And we, we love our area. Others have come in and like um, Ella said, have, you know, have changed things. They don't mind changing um, your, your value. They don't mind changing what, what value, what we um, consider being value to us. And so uh, the Central Park Road uh, it has really uh, brought in a lot of change in our community. And the change is, 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 not, is not what we're used to. By placing the signs in this different place and different areas, it'll help the, the, those that are coming in to understand this, the, the strong heritage of this island, of this section. They will understand and know, have an understanding and a knowledge of the historical uh, places that Blacks own, Blacks started. Uh, education was a value. That's why we had the, the, we started with just the small schools, the, the elementary schools. The education was very important. Um, they will know that we were spiritually sound and that uh, we knew that we know where our health came from. And so we wanted to establish that. And we had our church. And also, even with the uh, store, there was entrepreneurship here. There was people who cared and who wanted to help the community. And so with that, the growth of people came. This, this is a, a nice area. This is, this is wonderful. And with that, our connection, our, we just, we grew. This area cross cut, just like they say, was built from the place. And we had several people within this area that was teachers, doctors, lawyers. And that comes from the heritage of how we were taught and the value we needed to put back into our history by giving in different areas. And also we have, we, we had two seniors that died about a couple of years ago that was 100 years old. And we have one gentleman, Mr. Bowles, he's 93 now, and he retired from the Navy. And he's real strong in his neighborhood. He still plants vegetables. He calls us or he brings us to us. You can get collard greens, cabbage, squash, whatever. And this is from where he came from. To keep giving and let people know you give to the community what you have grown to help the community build a strong way of helping each other. And when somebody's in need, you are there to give. I'm Devetta Sanders Richardson. 
and I'm Edward Lee, and we're both from the Scanlonville community, better known as Remley's Point by the Charleston residents. Scanlonville was a community started in 1868. It was new for the South. It was new for the United States. It came out of necessity. 614 acres purchased at the height of Reconstruction by a freed man named John Scanlon, who founded the Charleston Land Company with a hundred other former slaves. Well, this, we can go this way since it's kind of clear, but um, this is, like I said, the road that we will be actually um, improving so we have a roundabout to, because right now, um, and as you can tell, we recently buried one of our, as we call them, homeboys, um, just um, passed away, so we are actively still buried. Well, like a lot of communities of that time, we had to take care of all our own needs. Mm -hmm. Everything was segregated, so even the cemeteries were segregated. But the community had its own cemetery. And uh, after Hugo, we had a lot of down trees, had a lot of debris in the cemetery. So we banded together to get it cleaned up. This project has taught me to look at cemeteries totally differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I have Mexican friends mm -hmm. and they the way they treat, the the, yeah, the mm -hmm. way they treat their dead and the sure, and, and cemeteries sure. is like a party almost, like yeah. it's a big celebration. And I've been brought up to believe that, you know, cemeteries are scary places. That's where all the boogeymen go, right? Like, a lot of cemeteries are by waterways, mm. usually on the west side of the water, mm. but um, in our case, we're on the east eastern bank. Well, a family was cruising the the, the waterway, saw the cemetery and thought it was abandoned. Didn't realize that there are different burial cultures and traditions. You know, and he saw the property, right? And then he thought, oh, that might be a nice site to have, um, to build a house. So when they went back to the boat landing and, you know, um, took the boat, put the boat back on the trail, they came around here and walked to the area and they saw a few graves in there. But they thought the property was pretty good. I mean, look at it, you got a creek yeah. and you got a creek and yeah. surrounded by water. So um, they looked up who they thought owned the property. Mm -hmm. And of course, this person is, they claimed to own the property. He said, of course I own the property. I'll sell it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So miraculously, here comes the deed and title, mm -hmm. transferring it from one person to the other. And by the end of the day, they had, um, what do you call a, it was a quick claim deed, deed in the morning, and, and it was a warranty deed, warranty by, the deed by, the by the end of the day. What? All right. Thank so he well. sold over a million dollars. And we, it ended up in a court battle, and we won the court battle. Um, the outcome was that it would always be a cemetery. Then later on, we got awarded this, the actual property. So now we own the cemetery. So what we're doing is we're trying to maintain it, keep it clean. And that award that you receive from the Center for Heirs Property Preservation is helping you maintain that lot or helped you open it? Or what specifically did it help It's going to help us maintain, maintain it. it. Um, Mr. Scanlon, uh, is actually buried in the cemetery mm -hmm. um, and he's got a small marker and since I mean he he's the founder of the community we like to do something more prominent for him mm -hmm. and okay. access to the cemetery needs to be improved and there are a number of items okay. that need to be taken all care right, of. All right. and, and so how is the community in general do you think going to benefit from the work that you're doing from this award that you received from the Center for Air Property Preservation? Um, we're looking to definitely um, let everyone, and especially the community, be more aware of what's going on. Because a lot of the new residents, should I say, have no idea about, no clue about the history of the community in general. Um, because, as Mr. Lee mentioned, um, with the building codes now, and half an acre, I mean, average builder would come in there, try to put three, four, five houses right. on it. So then if you have such a strong community or sense mm -hmm. of community, then how is gentrification kind of eroding at that sense of community? I think we used to know majority of our neighbors. And um, like you say, family, we knew one another, we played outside um, and we ate. I mean, but now some builders, when they come in, they put up privacy fences. We always had an open community, and now some try to make their own little private community. So like communities within the community? 
yeah, that we, aren't really servicing. Yeah, we've everyone. got that going on. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and one thing that you mentioned I want to follow up on, something small, privacy fences. Mm -hmm. The way we grew up, you had a fence if you had animals. Oh, uh, okay. So the fence kept the dogs in, or somebody had chickens, or had livestock. Yeah, then you had a fence. Otherwise, you didn't have a fence. Mm. And if you wanted to go somewhere in the community, you didn't necessarily go down the street. You took the shortest right. ride. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You, would, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. you would walk in somebody's <laughs> backyard, yeah, yeah. and that was common. Right. Uh, with newer people moving in, that presented a conflict. Because mm. the older folks and the, and the kids, they were still used to just, if I want to go to somebody's house that lived on the other block, I wouldn't walk around the block. Mm. I just walked through your backyard. Right. Yeah, right, 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 yeah right, right, that, right. That, that bothered a lot of folks. Yeah, And yeah. it's those little things that you lose when the yeah. neighborhood starts changing and the community starts changing. You don't realize it yes. right. until it happens, right? Right. Yes. right. Some had farms, some right. had, you know, gardens, all of that. It was just, it's just a cultural thing that, um, that we're trying to maintain. And you think with this new sense of direction that you'll be able to alert not only the new residents but just people in general of the importance of that area because i'm i'm from north charleston mm -hmm. and before having this conversation with you i mean i knew the place exists i didn't know any of what you're telling me today so is that one of your goals to to make sure that more than just the people who live there know about the history of this place yeah that's exactly um once well the, the, the court case in which we won the cemetery back, um, that had a good deal of coverage mm. and that generated a lot of interest. Mm. And uh, working with the, the Dalagichi Corridor mm -hmm. folks, um, that uh, generated a good bit of interest. So we've been getting folks calling, wanting to see the place. Mm. A lot of folks wanted to see the cemetery. So uh, we want to have a more formal tour. And we've had uh, interest from uh, actually some, some uh, international interest. LA Times has been there, and some of the um, larger uh, newspapers have been there. Y'all famous. So, oh, well, a lot famous. of recognition, but yeah. Yeah. some recognition probably didn't quite <laughs> yeah. receive. Oh, yeah. well, yes. Well, no. before we depart, is there anything else that you think people need to know about the work y'all are doing with this land? Well, I think mainly the, the history and the founder, Mr. Scanlonville himself, being buried there and us looking into um, placing a monument in his memory because, I mean, if it wasn't for him, Scanlonville, as also known as Rimley's Point, I mean, just would not have been there. I go to this well. I can feel the residue of what the, my parents and other friends of my parents are and uh, that what they left there it's it's you can feel the spirit that's still there that holy spirit that's still there I am Magdalene Mitchell Glover I am the program coordinator I am Gloria F Mitchell the treasurer I am Charles E. Mitchell, the Assistant Director of Faith, Hope, and Charity Society. The organization was started in 1918. When I joined, it was under the leadership of Reverend Joe Edwards. We had a great time for the many years that we were there, and we did a good job uh, helping out people in the community. Okay, okay. And could you, could you tell people who aren't familiar, what is the aim of the project you're working on for the Center for Heirs Property Preservation? As of now, it's an old prayer house that is in our community, and it has deteriorated quite a bit. We wanted to restore it, to have it back to the original place where we would feel comfortable going in and have service, uh, prayer, meeting where... Uh, we could get together and tell our experience about life and hopefully when we talked about what we have went through, it would help empower others that they may be able to understand that they can go through it also too. So as of now, we are trying to get it back and make it a place where people, when they pass by, they would see, know it, and we are 
trying to give them an appetite that they would want to come in and be a part of it. We do need a hot water heater in there, one of the improvement, because we do know now with what's going on, we have to have the hot water in there. All public buildings require to have hot water. We need to have uh, lines put up to the window. There are some deteriorating boards on the outside that needs to be fixed up. The doors that house what we have in there to keep everything safe, they need to be replaced also too. We are looking at painting the exterior of the building. So we're looking at all of these things and trying to also have a nice little small kitchen on the side for those who may come out to the prayer house and have some kind of medical issue, they would be able, we will be able to have something in there or for them to keep the, the medicine for the blood, uh, sugar or whatever it might take, you know. So we, we wanted to have it where it would be a prayer house, but almost like your house also too, where you could sit in and relax and enjoy yourself. That was a good line. Wanted to be a prayer house, but also like your house. That's good. You might want me some t-shirts. I'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> Community will benefit from this project by our coming together, not only the elderly, but even the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. We will come together and teach them the Our Father prayer, even have a meal together. Sit down at the table, which we don't do now. Sit down at the dinner table, put the cell phones away, and let's talk about life. In so many areas now in community, we don't have places where the elderly feel comfortable or safe going. We also want it to be a safe haven for them also too, that they would feel safe coming there. And if necessary, if they want to bring their sewing machine, if they're still sewing, they could come and do a little sewing there or a little knitting or crochet or whatever they might feel like they're doing. We want them to feel at home and want them to know that because they're old, we haven't forgot them. We are still looking out for a place for them also too, to feel safe and comfortable in. Is there anything that you want the outside world to know about this prayer house? Something maybe that you hold special, something you hold dear that you want other people to know about? I remember my father telling me that the person who was over him while he was on his sick bed called my dad to his sick bedside and asked him, Ernest, whatever you all do, do not let this prayer house go down. When my dad was uh, getting ready to leave this side, he also called and talked to some of us too as a group, said whatever you all do, keep the prayer house going down because there's a lot of history in it there and the older one needs some place where they could go and feel comfortable and just get a meal or just talk things over at time. Because a lot of time people just want a listening ear that they can uh, talk about some things. You can't do nothing, but they would like for you to listen. Yeah. Michael was able to just sit there and church and Went on home and be with the Lord. Wow. But everybody here has a story. They were a family member to somebody, and we would like to try to get pictures of them, you know, to tell them some about them, where they come from, to go along our history, because in order for us to move forward, we have to know where we came from. My name is Reverend Demeter R. Davis, and I represent Grace Chapel Baptist Church in Adams Run, South Carolina. Adams Run is a rural area. Um, the church was founded uh, by Reverend Joe Young in the late 1800s. The date is actually kind of unclear for sure, but we know the church property was deeded like in 1901, um, and he served the community before he passed, and all the, the older people said that he would gather all the children in the community and teach them how to pray. 
So our church is unique in the fact that it sits right on the fork of the road. It's a little white church, which we like to call the Holy Ghost headquarters. All right. And so we, we serve anybody going out of battle in front of coming in, you got to kind of pass the church. So we try to serve all the, com the community in that area. We, we fellowship with um, other local churches in the area, and we just try to um, spread the gospel. That's great. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, um, Charleston is growing. Uh, is Adam Run experiencing any gentrification? Um, not particularly so much at this time. I know like in that area, Parker's Ferry area, which is where near where the church is at is also, there's a lot of development going on in the area. So we expect the influx of people um, in the near future. Mm. Like a lot of uh, churches in the black community, a lot of uh, history is lost. So we've got graveyards, um, headstones in the back that date back to the 1800s um, due to lack of care. The debris and the shrubbery is, is overgrown on some of them. Some of the headstones are cracked. You can only see partial dates and names. The founder of the church, as well as his wife, are uh, buried behind the church, and they were born like the late 1800s. They were in the army at the time when they could only be cooks and things like that, and all that information is on the, on the headstones. And we've got quite a few members who date back to the 1800s. But like I said, you know, people are unaware of, of it, that it's back there. There's you know, not much upkeep. So we just like to preserve the history and let us know that, you know, from where we started to where we are at now. That's awesome. Is there a benefit that the community can expect to see once this project is completed? The benefit will be historical. You know, like I said, we were only allowed to be cooked at a certain point in time. Now you can see where we are generals and, and things like that, but you have to know where you started from to know how much you progress. And in other areas, you know, some things for our community hasn't changed at all. So that's an example for us to, you know, to say that we've not completed the fight. We have to push forward and educate our black community of all the possibilities that we have. The community was started um, subdivision in 1956, and uh, it was started for African Americans during that time. They had intentions of building houses, new homes for people during that time. And so that was one of the starter homes, the first home on the, on the corner there. But Mr. Davis uh, built his house himself, and he told me that when he moved, there was just about four houses here, that one included. And uh, he had to uh, pump water from a house that was way in the back and bring it to his house to build this cinder block home here. My name is Anna Johnson and I am County Council Member for Charleston County District 8. My name is Geraldine Frazier Mentor and I actually am not living in the James Allen community at the moment, but I grew up there and um, I feel like I never left. The community I want to talk about has been in existence since the late 1800s and uh, including the subdivision, Carver subdivision which was created in 1956. It is just amazing the things that, that these people did, that uh, freedmen, that sharecroppers, they created a community that against all odds, they created something lasting, loving, um, that is worthy of preserving. In doing this project, we've done some research where you know, we went back uh, to find who were beginners in the late 1800s, and also uh, like a second wave of land purchase for the Carver subdivision in the 50s. So this was 56, and here you're talking about a new subdivision being built for African Americans. First one, I think it was 40 lots there. So to have property that was uh, divided by a half quarter acre, putting in uh, roads and drainage, that was unheard of. So this project in involves signs, um, historic signs and markers. I worked with Ms. Council Member Anna Johnson and um, was actually uh, called about the project and just felt like it was timely. Uh, actually, I felt like it was overdue. We're trying to either have the sign on that corner there or right on this corner here. It uh, gives the community an opportunity to show some pride about the community, uh, talk about the name of the community, and the people who helped to create the community. What the plan is, is to 
move this point of the fence and move it back as far as we can without violating any of the uh, Grand Oak laws regarding the trees. And we plan and hope to put the sign right in the center here as the traffic approach this, um, this fork in the road. You know, a lot of the children now who are um, inheriting these properties, they don't know who the original owner was. A while back, probably around the 80s, there was some clearing, land clearing going on for a piece of property across from the subdivision, the Carver subdivision. And uh, this was land that was being cleared to possibly build housing, but it ended up with a school being there with a great big pond. We love the pond and we love the school, but here again, uh, this was farming land. Now recently I noticed there have been uh, several pieces of properties that went up for sale when the original owners passed away. And so their children are now selling these properties. And the land is being uh, divided, some of them, where there are uh, new people coming in the community and also there is a, a higher concentration of uh, the use of the property. Preserving uh, the community is uh, one of my number one uh, things now to do and um, it's something that I think the new heirs or the ancestors, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of people who purchase land uh, in that area should be, become more familiar with the uh, original property owners and the importance of why they should preserve the Grimble community and the Carver subdivision. Once we get the signs and notate these areas, I think people will start inquiring as to who are these people. Uh, in 1899, my great-great-grandfather walked off of a plantation in Sandy Cooper and made his way to the Grimble plantation asking the Grumbles just to be a sharecropper first. Later, by 1899, he had massed property to pass down to his children and his children's children. Remember, this is a former slave who amassed so much property that he could divide it among seven girls. How did they accomplish this when all the odds were against them, when they were former slaves um, and, and sharecroppers? It is an incredible story of courage and of love. My name is James C. Hampton and I live in Lincolnville, South Carolina, and I've lived there for about 46 years. Is there a way to like, you know how they radar seabed? Can you like radar the ground and see where all the... Well, my wife and I were talking about that because there is a uh, instrument that can detect where it remains off. Got you. They'll be able to do that either through uh, the metal caskets mm -hmm. or the metal or whatever, or either they can, the, the, I guess, the radiation that comes from the bone. Yeah. yeah. Lincolnville was actually established a gentleman by the name of Richard Harvey King. He was a minister, AME minister, in Charleston. But even after slavery, the blacks, Negroes, did not feel as if they were being treated properly, so many of them were looking for some, place else, some other place to settle. So Richard Harvey King and six additional gentlemen boarded a South Carolina local, Charleston local, which was a train, and they were looking for a place to settle. So the train left Charleston, headed out west, and came to a, a location uh, which is now Lincolnville, but it was called at that time Pump Pond, uh, and it was actually a place where the train stopped to water up and also take on firewood for power. And uh, while there, those seven men, Richard Harvey King, uh, those other six men, were standing outside looking around 
and they were also looking for land to purchase, which that land was uh, owned by the railroad company, and they chose to uh, buy 620 acres of land. And it was established then by that settlement of gentlemen and many other people that they brought on. And it has been operating ever since. I can't even tell you exactly how many people are actually buried here because I don't know. I might go to the Aiken Funeral Home or Albert Glover Funeral Home in Somerville and see if I could uh, get some information from them, like mm -hmm. the historical. The cemetery actually started back in 1860, about 1869. So the cemetery was, was established because naturally as people live, people die, and they had some place to bury. Uh, after a while though, that uh, the cemetery was actually deeded over to the town of Lincolnville as the Bible Sojourn Society Cemetery. However, it was not kept up. As a result of that, and for some reason, it also went on tax sale. It was purchased by a, a gentleman by the name of Dak Frazier. And Dak Frazier, uh, knowing that there was not, it was limited in what he could do with the cemetery, he was asked by myself and the mayor in the town of Lincolnville that he would consider donating it to the town. He, he decided to do that. After Hurricane Hugo, the cemetery was cleaned by myself and uh, another, my neighbor, Enoch Dickerson, and another gentleman. Many years later, another hurricane came through, and uh, we, the town, utilized a group of students that come from Boston every year to work in town Lincolnville during their spring break to clean the cemetery. After they left, another hurricane come through, trees down, so therefore the, the uh, VFW, uh, the town of Lincolnville, and others commit to clean the cemetery, however, never really cleaning it thoroughly. So. Uh, the Civic League, uh, which is a, a group that was a part of Lincolnville, was really appalled by the, the way the cemetery looked. So as a result, the mayor and council now uh, and the citizens have come together to decide that we need to do our due diligence. First of all, we need to look at the uh, historical marker for it because it's a his historical cemetery. Second, we need to look at forest, having it actually surveyed off to make sure we know exactly what we're dealing with. In addition to that, uh, the next thing we need to do is to make sure we clean it and uh, then we fence it and, and contain it to make sure we maintain it. And that main purpose is for three reasons. One is to make sure that we uh, secure it to the point where it can be utilized by the citizens there now. And also the second would be the family members of the people that are buried there now will be able to come back to it. And then the final thing would be a historical marker there to be put on the uh, Gullah Geechee Trail. And that's what we plan to do. Till my head.